Good day to everyone. We will now discuss about consequentialism. This is the flow of our discussion. We'll begin by defining what is consequentialism. Then we will see the different variations or forms of consequentialism, which will vary from one author to another author. And we'll also try to look at the pros and cons of consequentialism. It's positive effect and the downside of this moral theory. Here are the references that we'll be using. Uh, I put it in the beginning because it's important to note that one author may vary his perspective to the other author. Some of the ideas of one author, particular author, is not found in the other author they also differ and they may also complement. So the books that we'll be using are the books of Articulo and Florendo, Babor, Castillo, Montemayor, and Sinot Armstrong. Now we go to the definition. Consequentialism by its name suggests it is simply the view that normative properties depend only on the consequences. Consequentialism is about the moral rightness of acts, which holds that whether an act is morally right depends only on the consequences of that act. The worth of an action should be judged according to the result, the product, the end, what works, what is practical, it brackets what is intrinsically moral act because it only looks at the consequences. Therefore, good consequences is equal to good actions, and bad consequences is equal to bad action. Here we have example cases of consequentialism. Keeping in mind the basic precept of consequentialism that an act is good, if it produces pleasure, happiness, or good result, we can have these example cases to help us determine if an act is ethical or unethical based on the consequentialism principle. However, these examples are just general examples of consequentialism since there are still other forms of or variations of it. Number one, with a rule, if the end of an act promotes unhappiness, even if it has intended to promote the greatest happiness, the act can be considered morally wrong. So, with this case, the case of the killer milk. A milk company has a genuine commitment, not just for sales, but to social services like feeding programs and charities. They have their charity work to Aetas of Mount Taringa. Days after the feeding program, many Aetas died before they were brought to the hospital. The cause of death was later found severe lactose intolerance and allergies caused by the company's milk. In this case, it is undeniable that the act intended to promote the happiness of many people but its consequence has resulted in the contrary, that is, in the suffering and death of many. Since the act failed to observe the principle of consequentialism, regardless of the nobility of its purpose, the act is unethical. The second example with this rule, if the end of an act has promoted the greatest amount of happiness of the greatest number of people, whatever means the act is the act employs is morally justified. So here we have the case of Dr. Robin Hood. Dr. Robin Hood is a medical doctor who has a sincere conviction that everyone must, most especially the poor, must enjoy the benefits of good medical care. The conviction made him conduct medical mission to serve the poor who cannot afford the cost of medical care. One day he realized that he could no longer afford another medical mission. Left with little option, he makes one last desperate act. 
he steals from his hospital all the medical supplies he needed for his medical missions since the hospital had a huge stockpile of medicines and other medical items. He felt his act is justified because he did not do it for his personal ends but for the benefits of poor people. Under the consequentialism principle, the act of Dr. Robin Hood is morally good even if the act employs an unethical means, which is stealing. The means is morally justified, justifiable because it is an instrument used by the act to achieve the utilitarian end of promoting the happiness of greatest number of people, that is, the happiness of the poor mass who benefit from the medical missions. Hospital patients who would later need the medical items are not necessarily denied by the act because, as indicated by the case, the hospital had sufficient supplies of medicine. We have the third case here with a rule if an act unintentionally produces the greatest amount of happiness, the act is still morally good. So we have the case of a prank caller. Mr. Juan is an employee of a respectable company. When he feels bored on the job, which is often the idea of making prank calls, becomes irresistible. One afternoon, he amused himself by calling a nearby police station and reporting an imaginary bank robbery in progress. The joke sounded too real, a case of bank robbery not far from where he worked. The police chief, fully convinced of the authenticity of the report, immediately dispatched the police officers to respond to the crime. A day after, Mr. Huan was shocked when he heard a report about a bank robbery, a true bank robbery foiled by an anonymous caller. The time the call was made and the place of the crime proved that his prank call successfully foiled a bank robbery which led to the arrest of a notorious group of bank robbers. Without question, using the office of telephones for personal and unnecessary purposes is unethical. The intention of the act is malicious, also including the lying. But in the particular case, the act even if unethical, can be considered morally good since it has produced an, an intentional consequence that satisfies the consequential principle. This rule also covers cases where moral acts result in consequences contrary to the intention of the agent. For example, in the cases where the act of the agent intends only to benefit himself or only the few but has unintentionally benefited the many the act is still considered to be morally good. Here are the forms and variations of consequentialism. I use forms and variations, but actually some of these crisscross with one another. They mean either the same or somehow related. So the way I put it is that these are the keywords that we will always hear when we see the different views of consequentialism. So we have the hedonism, and then we have egoism or egoistic hedonism. Some authors would use them the same. And then we have psychological hedonism, physical pleasure and mental pleasure. We need to know them in order to distinguish what particular consequentialism is discussed. Then the individual or egoistic utilitarianism or simply egoism and social or altruistic utilitarianism or simply altruism. Then the utilitarianism with its act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. I know it's not yet making sense at this moment but just bear with it and anyhow we will uh, run through it in the discussion. Those keywords, as the way I put it, because they are found from one author to another author, but the way I sum them up, the hedonism will have same definition or same connotation with egoism, 
or egoistic hedonism on or the psychological hedonism or in terms of physical pleasure or the individual or egoistic utilitarianism or simply egoism while the utilitarianism these are the words under it the act utilitarianism the rule utilitarianism the mental pleasure the social or altruistic utilitarianism or simple simply altruism so now we will go to them one by one hedonism hedonism is a form of consequentialism which claims that pleasure is the only intrinsic good and that pain is the only intrinsic bad hedonism is like equal to the value of the consequences depends only on the pleasures and pains and the consequences as opposed to the other supposed goods such as freedom knowledge life and so on hedonism is an ethical theory which holds that the supreme end of human person consists in the acquisition of pleasure and that action are good or bad according to whether they give or do not give worldly pleasure or temporal happiness to man morality therefore is grounded on the pleasure or satisfaction that an act brings or entails the good action is the pleasant action and then the bad action is what produces pain under hedonism we have egoistic hedonism and psychological hedonism in egoistic hedonism the contention which is valued is that man is primarily obligated to seek for his own pleasure even if it means the deprivation of others this is of course destructive so there's a need to provide sanctions to the excessive demands of pleasure if it were desired only for the sake of self-gratification in psychological hedonism the contention that man by nature is capable of doing only those actions which give him pleasure and that he avoids those actions that give him pain is embraced doing the opposite of this means man's violation of his nature by nature it is said that man is subject to two sovereign masters pleasure and pain however this requires that man should only follow what is natural in him that is to do an act in the name of pleasure and avoid those actions which render him pain two general forms of pleasure which is the physical and mental we need to discuss this because as we have heard the definition of hedonism under consequentialism a lot of thinkers are criticizing consequentialism accusing it to be a very narrow moral theory because it only based its uh, criteria on the pleasure and pain however here articulo and florendo clarifies that hedonism is just part of the forms of consequentialism which uh, use which is using the physical pleasure but there's also another kind of pleasure which is the mental pleasure which is associated to utilitarianism understandably putting the concept of pleasure at the heart of this theory in the hedonism made many detest it as a decent standard of conduct for everyday men the idea of happiness or pleasure as the ultimate end of human action is from the very start unethical many think this theory of life is worthy only of a swine because of the common idea that pleasure means physical or bodily gratification the objection is unfounded let us clarify this misconception by clarifying that utilitarian precept of pleasure regarding so again just one part of pleasure is the physical pleasures these are sensual indulgences or bodily gratifications that 
include, among others, sexual intercourse, eating, drinking, rest, etc. Ill-regulated desires make man pursue pleasure to the injury of health, even if man knows that health is a greater good. This kind of pleasure is considered as animalistic or beastly and make up the lower forms or inferior types of pleasure. Physical pleasure appeals to people's lower faculties and persons desiring nothing but physical pleasure are considered lowly and less dignified. Whereas the mental pleasure, which is the one associated to utilitarianism, refers to intellectual, spiritual, and moral pleasures. Mental pleasures feed man's noble feelings, imaginations, and moral sentiments. They are higher or superior form of pleasure, more desirable and more valuable as compared to those of mere sensation. Mental pleasures are generally more difficult to achieve, but make man more dignified. They include, among others, the enjoyment of free will and intellect, social recognition and regards, feeling of self-worth and respect, feeling of peace and security. Mental pleasure is that the utilitarian theory of morality, which appeals to when it calls for the promotion of pleasure or happiness. This corrects the misconception that utilitarianism is a theory worthy of a swine. Human beings have faculties far more elevated than animal appetites and desire greater pleasure than the pleasure only swine are capable of. Human pride and dignity make man desire a greater form of happiness, even when man's pursuit of happiness leads to personal dissatisfaction. He think, still thinks he ought not to settle for a beast pleasures, for these do not satisfy human beings' conceptions of happiness. According to John Stuart Mill, it is better to be a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than to be fools satisfied. Mental pleasures for the utilitarians, happiness or pleasure and freedom from pain are the only things desirable as ends. These are the only things that can determine if acts are good or contrary to good. If any act promotes or has promoted happiness or pleasure, regardless of the goodness of its motive, the act is good. Utilitarianism thus rejects any supernatural basis for morality and makes human welfare or human happiness the ultimate standard of right and wrong. At this point, it should be recalled that the utilitarian concept of happiness does not mean the agent's own greatest happiness, but the greatest amount of happiness put together. This means that even the interest of the agent or the doer of the moral act must be sacrificed if it runs contrary to the happiness of the greatest number. Thus, the quality of and quantity of pleasure or happiness are taken into account in the utilitarian moral calculation. We now discuss utilitarianism. As a recap, everything we have discussed so far is about consequentialism. Consequentialism evaluates the goodness of an action based on the result or the consequences. One form of it is hedonism, which is looking for the physical pleasure kind of consequences. Another form of consequentialism is utilitarianism, which is not so much based on the physical pleasure, but on the mental pleasure. However, some books would say that hedonism or the, the physical pleasure is part of utilitarianism. Hedonism is like a lower kind of utilitarianism. Anyway, I mentioned from the beginning that they overlap with one another depending on what author or what book we are using. Like Montemayor, he distinguishes 
two types of utilitarianism. One is individual or egoistic utilitarianism or simply egoism, which is very similar to hedonism. And then second is social or altruistic utilitarianism or simply altruism. According to individual utilitarianism, the norm of morality resides in the usefulness of an action for the production of temporal happiness of the individual. Therefore, an act is good when it redounds to the temporal welfare and happiness of the individual and bad if it hinders or hampers this happiness. Social utilitarianism, on the other hand, is that type of utilitarianism which holds that an act is good when it is conducive to the social good or well-being. This is so-called altruism as distinguished from the first which is called egoism. As you may notice in those two types of utilitarianism, the individual is related to the physical pleasure and to hedonism while the social is related to the mental pleasure and to the real sense of utilitarianism. So here we elaborate more what is utilitarianism. The paradigm case of consequentialism is utilitarianism, whose classic proponents were Jeremy Bentham in 1789, John Stuart Mill in 1861, and Henry Sedwick in 1907. These claims are often summarized in the slogan that an act is right if and only if it causes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Utilitarianism is consequentialist as opposed to the ontological because of what it denies. It denies what moral rightness depends directly on anything other than consequences. Utilitarianism is a theory very much akin to hedonism. It makes utility the norm of morality good that which administers to the temporal welfare and happiness of man, bad which obstructs or hinders or retards this happiness. According to the utilitarian view, the goodness or badness of an action would depend on the effects or consequences of the action. An act is good if and when it gives good results, if it works, practical, pragmatic, it, if it makes you successful if it makes you attain your purpose, bad if it does not. Here we have two div divisions of utilitarianism. The utilitarianism that we mean here is already the truest sense of utilitarianism, which is not a hedonistic one because this already considers the happiness of others in majority or in general. Utility here is not just for the ego or the pleasure of the individual, which is the hedonistic type, but for the disinterested people, even the people not related to you. So the utilitarianism can be divided into two, act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism is the ethical demand which requires that man should act so as to produce the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. Act utilitarianism is also called eudaimonistic and hedonistic utilitarianism. In act utilitarianism, the rule of individual and general happiness is applied to the particular act. Hence, given the foreseen consequences, the question is whether or not the particular act under consideration leads to individual and general happiness. An example for this is when there are four patients in the hospital needing organ transplant, a heart, liver, kidney, and eyes, and there is one healthy person compatible to those four patients. The act utilitarianism would suggest that one health that one healthy person must be sacrificed for the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. There is, this is a cruel kind of utilitarianism under that consequences.
Hence, they, they modify it from a utilitarianism to rule utilitarianism. Rule utilitarianism, on the other hand, holds that man should act so that the rule governing his actions will produce the greatest happiness for the most number of people. Hence, utilitarianism would instead consider whether the act under consideration belongs to the type of acts which, based on the common experience and tradition, are likely to promote general happiness or the opposite. This case would not be the same to the act utilitarianism that would sacrifice one person even without the consent of the individual because it looks at the general rule as a principle. Sacrificing an individual with no consent for the sake of others would not bear happiness for all as a general rule because in the long run, all people would be anxious and scared if time will come, it will be their turn to be sacrificed without their consent. Therefore, it will not produce a good consequences. We go now to the pros and cons of consequentialism. Here we have critical appreciation of hedonism and utilitarianism by Montemayor. Merits of these theories. Hedonism and utilitarianism explain very well the emotional basis and aspects of human actions. There is always some satisfaction accompanying the doing of every good act. Hedonism or utilitarianism or the consequentialism in general also explains well the reason behind the doing of action by most people, where there is no doubt that most of them are motivated in their action by their desire for satisfaction or happiness or the well-being of the self and also of the others or the common good. Here we have the problems of utilitarian morality by Articolo and Florendo. The strength of utilitarian theory as a theory of life lies in its emphasis of human welfare as the ultimate standard of right and wrong. This is like a two-bladed sword, however, it is its strength at the same time the source of own weakness. The utilitarian theory or the consequentialism treats everything as conditional and subservient to utility. Violations of human rights and other unethical acts become morally justifiable as long as they promote the utilitarian tenet of the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. It is difficult to imagine discrimination or corruption as morally good simply because it is made for the greatest number of person to be happy. Another problem, many correctly argue that the most serious problem of this theory is its attempt to quantify human dignity, that is the treatment of human beings as mere numbers, especially in the utilitarian calculation. The happiness of 50 persons justifies the denial of the happiness or even the life of one person. Human beings are far greater than mere numbers. Individually, they have dignity which must be treated with respect. The theory falls short in explaining or justifying the idea that the well-being of the individual or of the minority must be sacrificed for the interest of the many. Some question what gives many the moral right to violate and or to disregard the interest of the few or of the particular individual. There's no clear basis why the greatest number must always prevail over the interest of the few. This makes others think that the utilitarian theory or consequentialism lead to the tyranny of the greatest number or the tyranny of the majority. What happens to the less fortunate few if we always think about of the happiness and pleasure of many? The other problem of utilitarianism is its overemphasis on the calculation of casual consequences. Most of the time, life presents situations where we need to decide fast with life room or with little room for calculation. If we calculate all the persons who will benefit and all who will suffer every time we make our decisions, we will all end up doing nothing 
or we will find ourselves acting too late. We have here defects of hedonism and utilitarianism by Montemayor. Both propose an earthly goal for man, namely the temporal welfare here on earth. Whereas we have already proven the former thesis that the ultimate and supreme purpose of man cannot be found in this life. Both and the second both make or tend to make morality relative, since what is pleasant or useful to one may be painful or harmful to another, but relative morality leads to moral chaos and destruction. Both theories make morality extrinsic because they make it depend on the effect or the or on a concomitant factor of an act, whereas as we have already shown, morality is intrinsic that is is based on the very essence of things and on the nature of the act itself hedonism and utilitarianism may mistake the indicative for the constitutive they confuse the nature of the act and the effect of the act as they should mistake the symptom for the disease there are still many things to discuss and many things to clarify Nevertheless, having learned the beauty and the downside of consequentialism, all the more we need to balance this moral theory with our keen practice of critical thinking. That is it for today and thank you.